Fireside Chat, Episode 10. Feaster, change you can believe in? Recorded March 26th, 2013. Are you ready? See you around. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. Matt Lucas, we're back, and I, you know, I almost wondered tonight: is this even worth doing? Is there even anything to talk about with this team? But here we are, ready to talk about the team for yet another Fireside Chat episode. How do you guys feel after the Chicago game tonight? Well, refreshed after the nap. <laughs> I feel um, bored. It felt like a chore. It it was uh, it was an unpleasant experience. And not just because those stupid ATB commercials go on for a minute and a half. Or maybe it's not a minute and a half, but, I mean, you've got two people talking inaudibly and just looking uncomfortable, which certainly makes the audience feel comfortable. And then uh, Mark Giordano comes out of nowhere and, frankly, let's be honest, boards the green man. That is a that is at least, like, that's a suspension. Like, last... The first part of what you mentioned, though, sounds like the Flames bench. You see the two Czech guys sitting there talking inaudibly, and then they pan to Giordano. Yeah, possibly. But, I mean, look, ATB or Sportsnet or somebody, cut the thing down. We know, we've we gotten the joke. Giordano's going to come. He's going to be the hero or felon, depending on which team you're a fan <laughs> of. And, and he's going to board the green man into the window. Now he's very lucky that that glass is sturdy and it doesn't sever an artery or something cuz that would be un- that would be a really unpleasant uh phone call. And, you know, it's good that he, you know, he gets to salute the crowd and all that, but like it should be 15 seconds. You've got goals, we've got the assists. And like the Williams defenseman Mark Giordano, bam. Uh helping people is in our nature or hospitalizing them. ATB for what matters most or whatever. Well, the thing I'd like to see is them actually do stuff like that on the ice, which has been completely non, <laughs> not happening at all. When was the last time you heard somebody say, I wish a player would perform on the ice like they did in the commercial? Yeah. <laughs> oh, LA Kings fans, when they saw an old commercial for NHL 94 on YouTube. Who was on the cover of NHL 94? Well, NHL 94 is the Jeremy Roenick game. And, uh... When he was the best player ever, he's, he's he's video game lore. I didn't even start playing that game till the '97. Uh, so I did. Oh, that, John Van Beesbrook was on the cover. That was uh, that was an awful game, but I also started playing NHL. The game froze on me every day. I had to uninstall it and reinstall it. But you know, they just released this freeware a couple of years ago. You can actually go out and EA is giving you a legal download of wow. NHL ninety seven. I used to. I had to up. My dad had to upgrade our computer from Windows three point one to Windows ninety five so I could play NHL ninety seven using a Gravis Gamepad Pro. So here we are, a week after our last podcast a lot has happened in the flames world and the best thing we've got to open our show with is an atb commercial and a video game that's more than 10 years old you can tell this team's really keeping people's interest can't you gentlemen i'm sorry who do we play tonight (laughs) uh the guys in the red good team yeah oh they're very good they're very well run they seem to scout and draft and value centers and have good defense and play with tenacity and look like they care What are those things? I, I that's foreign to me. I I think the key to to what Lucas just described is look like they care. Well, you know what they say: fake it till you make it, right? That's true. Well, guys, we're about a week away from trade deadline. This is our last show pre-trade deadline, and I'm hoping for the sake of this team and the fans that next week we're going to have a ton of stuff to talk about. Um, because this team's, I hope, going to be active. They have to be active. Um, And we were talking before the show, I mean, what happens if this team's not active? What's the worst-case scenario that can come out of trade deadline? Honestly, the worst thing that could happen is if they go out and waste young players or prospects and add. So, So they could be active, but in the wrong way. Yeah, 
because, like, if you say, like, add Derek Roy from Dallas or any of the other possible guys, like, this team is still terrible. And, you know, a band-aid's not going to help. Don't you know the answers are in the room, Matt? Oh, God, yes. Yeah, but not our room. That could be. Maybe the room is haunted. And that's why, like, they hear voices. Voices of past players, like Rico Fata? No, more like like voices of the demons in paranormal activity. It's like... Okay. No, just... Oh, no, because then if that were true... Well, I don't know. What demon says, like, get out? (laughs) Get off your ass and skate. No, we we just we need someone to like scare several players to not just to just not come back. You're like, I'll wave my new move clause. I don't care. I I don't know that there's a uh, a CBA clause around haunting players and getting them to leave and what that means to the salary. Exactly, cap. that means we can do it. There's no law that says we can't. Someone fix this up. Put put some microphones in, like. I don't know, put, put a subwoofer under Alex Tange's mattress at night so that, you know, he just <laughs> wakes up and his entire room is shaking. He's like, what the hell? And then, you know, just have someone... Just for legal reasons, I want to say if somebody actually does break into Tang's house and puts them under his mattress, you did not get told by us that you should be doing that. This is not an endorsement. This is just Lucas's opinion. It does not reflect Fireside Chat. No, don't break in, but if he leaves the door open, it's his own fault. Someone just sit on his house. Oh, All no, right. don't do that. There Who's you go. single? Who, who, who? I don't know. Giordano, do you have kids? I don't think you do. It's not like he's going to answer you. He's not on the line with no. us. He's out at the ATB commercial with the green or guys. shoot another one at least. And not one where you intimidate a ref. Does that sit wrong with anyone else? Because, I mean, if you... When's the last time the Flames intimidated Well, that's anyone? true, but, I mean, can you imagine what would happen if you did, like, a head fake at a ref? So, guys, going back to the worst-case scenario, um, if the Flames add at the deadline, if they decide that for some reason they're not sellers, they're buyers, do you think Feaster will keep his job long after that? I don't think he keeps his job through the announcement that they've added, if he actually does. Oh, my goodness. Like... I mean, we've heard in the past that Murray Edwards has been a hands-on owner. I mean, Edwards, hopefully, if they said they were going to add someone, would veto it. Oh, I, I would hope so, because in as much as, yes, Murray Edwards and Ken King allegedly might be hands-on, I don't think they're, you know, I, I don't think they're functionally retarded. Murray Edwards is a billionaire. He's one of the most successful men in the country, in the world. Um, I, I don't understand how he could be incapable of dealing with reality in this way. Yeah, like, it's gone to the past to the point where, like, there is absolutely zero excuse not to move players out. Like, the Flames have been one of the healthiest teams in the entire NHL. and For the first time as long as I can remember, because every year it's, oh, the Flames didn't make the playoffs because of injuries down the stretch. That's a convenient excuse. The reality, of course, is that they just haven't been good enough. It's, you know, you can dress it up however you want, but... You know, reality doesn't care. <laughs> no. And you look at the game tonight against Chicago, and, like, every line that Chicago had was better than our best players. Like, even their fourth line was dominating against the Flames. Like, I think the Flames ended up with, like, 15 shots. Like, this was supposed to be a must-win game. Like, if you're trying to not get, you know, the team blown up and, you know, try to make it close. And, like, last game they had only, like, 17 shots or something like that, and tonight, 15. Like, is that really your best effort when it's on the line? And shots tonight were 16 game? to 35 right. in favor, or 35 for Chicago, 16 for Calgary. Yeah. Like, this is what this team does, though. <laughs> Every time in the last three years when the Flames have been given the chance to matter, to take control of their own destiny, to really push and make some ground, 
into a playoff position or just a point where they could, you know, be close, um, they've crapped all over themselves. And at this point, like, it's to the point now where I'm, every time they win, I'm like, how dare you? Like, I understand that even a blind squirrel finds a nut and that in a league where the salary floor is $48 million, you're going to win some, but what's a meaningful game that the Calgary Flames have won in the last three years? They just don't. I can't really think of one. Like, even, like, back when they were making the playoffs, down the stretch, they'd have, like, a huge stretch of games where they'd lose when, you know, like, that one year where we had a 13-point lead on Vancouver with, like, 20 games to go, and Vancouver passed us. And it's like, how do you even Well, with that, that, you get yourself in cap hell by gambling and you can only ice nine forwards and you have to play two AHL defensemen. But... Yeah, I know, but... It, I see it, your point, though. It, it, that's the theme, though, of the Flames for, like, the last five, six years. And, you know, enough of the same story every day. Like, get new players in. Just something yeah. different. You know, it's like watching the same rerun of a TV show every, like, as soon as it ends, it starts again, it's the same episode. It's like, come on. Yeah, and I mean, this this is (laughs) why I felt like this was such a chore tonight. I mean, I I said to two different people that if I didn't have to do this podcast, um, I'm I'm not watching this game. I, I might watch a game or two after the deadline just to see what happens, see what the new guys do. But, like... It's to the point now where it's almost like life's too short to watch a, a group of uninteresting, un, just not compelling people go out and sort of try. Yeah, like even like because uh, I do have season tickets when I attend the, the home games, it's like why am I even here? And you know, like I l- look forward to seeing who's look good on the other teams and seeing how they're doing. But, you know, like, there's no storyline or anything of interest on what the Flames are doing. You can just see from watching it, it's completely uncoordinated. And, like, it's... The last two games, it's reminded me of uh, back a couple seasons ago when the Fl- Flames were playing the Flyers right before the trade deadline, and they forced Ole Jokinen to play the game even though he had been traded to the Rangers. And, like, they just came out and did absolutely nothing. And, like, that, it's the last two games have been a carbon copy of that. Like, there's been absolutely nothing. And... If this continues, like, who's going to waste their time? Like, you know, I could be taking a nap, and that would be more interesting. You know, it's funny, because I've been... Like, uh, one of my best friends lives in Edmonton and is a hardcore Oilers fan. And I've been razzing them for a couple of years, because their city's going through the same feelings we're feeling now. They're turning on the Oilers. And, you know, he said he never remembered a time when the city's turned on the Oilers as bad as they are. And when, I mean... When we can't even watch the team, I don't know how long you guys have been Flames fans, but I've been a Flames fan as long as I can remember. I mean, you know, before, when I was five, six, I was supporting this team as well as you can at that age. But, you know, I made it all the way through the Young Guns era, and so did so many people in the city. And for us to now be saying this is worse than the worst hockey this ever, this team's ever this city's ever seen and this team's ever played, and to now be turned on the team, that tells you how bad it's gotten. Well, the thing is, with the Young Guns era, like, the players were not good, but they tried. And you could see that they were trying, they just didn't have any talent. And, like, this time we have talent, but they just don't play. And, like, I've been a Flames fan since 1990, when I was five years old. And, you know, I stuck through that as well, and... You know, like, you could see there was some competitive spirit there, but, like, this team has absolutely none. Well, and the other thing to consider with, especially the young guns in the dark days in the 90s and the early 2000s is there wasn't any money to spend on the team. I mean, the dollar was, you know, basically, you know, 60-cent dollar, whatever. Um, 
there's only so much you could reasonably do. Uh, this is a cap max or capable max team, and we got whatever three million in cap space. Uh, so it, it, it is entirely the result of organizational either mismanagement or incompetence or something, and that's why it, it's far more justified that these uh, that that fans are turning on the team because th there was a legitimate reason for the lack of success before, and now it's just. A refusal to admit. So let me ask you wrong. guys this question, if you don't mind. Um, so throughout the last couple of years, and I'd say as far back as four or five, this organization has played the blame game. It's the coach. So we've gone through coaches. It's the GMs who changed the GMs. It's the core. And outside of Iggy and Kipper, I mean, this core has changed. Dion's gone. Robin's gone. Most of the core guys have been moved. So if, I mean, is is Rome the last piece we can move before we say? Who knows what this problem is? We need to get Dr. Phil or someone to come diagnose it? Like, to me, we're run out of options, and the front office is run out of excuses. Well, when you've basically changed everybody in the organization, except for Ken King, the owners, and Aginla and Kiprasov, like, you know, you can't really say it's, like, Murray Edwards' fault or Ken King's fault. Because they don't, they're not in control 110% of the on ice product. But, you know, like, you've gone through every possible thing that could be, except for Jerome and Kipper. Now, me personally, you know, goalies, they don't, they're not of the team in the same manner. So, like, I don't really think it's Kipper per se. But, you know, like, the, the team needs a culture change. And, that like, that's why, like, last week when you were saying, like, oh, well, should we get Aginla back if we trade him? Like, I think we just need to turn the page yeah, on no, you're right. this you, era. You, you, the team can't move on as long as Jerome's in a Flames jersey. Helps. Because, the, the, the... Yeah, it... Because it, it's apparent that it's just going to be the same kind of nonsense over and over again. And if something like this isn't working, you have to try something new. And honestly, th this is where the organization is really playing a dangerous game. Because, like, we're, I, I think I'd count all of us among the diehards. Um, we're growing apathetic. And that should be far more worrisome to the, uh, to the owners and the team then, oh, what's fan reaction going to be if we trade Jerome? If you trade Jerome, guess what? People are going to be upset, but that means people care. People were upset when Fleury got traded, too. I mean, he was the last face of this franchise, and people got over it very quickly. People were upset when Neuendijk got traded, and they got over it very quickly. Yeah, because there was a Ginla that you could go, oh, well, this is our new guy that's going to be taking the mantle of leader on this team after Fleury got traded. And it's somewhat similar to having Berchi in the farm. You know, like you can see that he's going to be a main piece going forward, but if you're stuck in the past, you just, you can't move forward. And we need to move forward. You know, I like I like what Lucas said earlier about how, you know, we're among the most hardcore fans. I mean, we wouldn't be doing this the show if we weren't. And the fact that we're going apathetic. I mean, when we talked in the summer about why we all wanted to do this show, it's because we wanted to have fun and talk about the Flames. And when this starts to feel like work, that's a bad thing. Yeah. Well, it, it, when you're straining to actually just talk about the Flames without deriding them at every possible chance, like... That's not good. No. And, like, look, the what you were saying earlier about, you know, having a replacement franchise player in the wings sort of does help. But, I mean, realistically, just because you don't know who your next girlfriend's going to be, should, that shouldn't preclude you from ending a bad marriage. With the deadline, unless you guys have anything more you want to rant about with the team, I know I'm feeling like i got to go on all night tonight, but I figured... Why don't we move on to some actual uh, pre-trade deadline discussion? Mm -hmm. 
big story for me this past week has been Iggy finally submitted the list, in air quotes, the list of teams he's willing to waive his no-trade clause for. And those four franchises, everyone probably knows by now, the Boston Bruins, the Chicago Blackhawks, the LA Kings, and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Where do you guys think he's going to end up? He if better I not end to, up here. I, if I had to bet, I would say Boston, just because he seems to have the most fit in terms of style of play with them. I would say that, uh, yeah, Boston would be my best guess. However, I think that if uh, Pittsburgh does decide that, you know what, to hell with it, we're going for it all this year anyway, here's Derek Pouliot. Uh, all of a sudden, like I don't know who has the possi- who has the potential to stop a team with Morrow, Iginla, Neal, Crosby, Malkin, Kunitz, Dupuis. Like who 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 are you, who are you defending? Like that, that's that's a nightmare. Yeah, like uh, it's just an onslaught one yeah, after like, th- another. Like, think about that. The only way you get all those guys on the ice at the same time is if you've got six skaters. Like th- that's. Well, and you're going to have to mortgage your future to do that, too, yeah, a little bit. who cares? The Stanley Cup's well, the, the ultimate thing goal, is, and that team... Well the, well, the Penguins, though, like they're, the majority of their prospects are defensemen, and most of their key defensemen are either under contract for a while or are rather young, like Lotang. So, it, you know, the, it's an area of depth for them. So get moving a, a prospect or two for a Ginla, like it's not as bad as if like they only had one player in that position. Mm-hmm. A rumor that I heard this week, and I don't know who started it. I haven't been able to trace it back to a legit source, but Iggy to LA for Bernier in a package, and that that I, intrigues me. The only uh, reason why I'm somewhat skeptical of that is that LA does not have a backup goaltender in the system. We got like three. We'll all... give them one. Uh, yeah, but Quick's not doing a hundred percent still from his off-season surgery. So, like, it's possible, but I, it doesn't seem right. You know. Might just be me, though. I really think after I've looked back at deals like this in the past, there's going to be a significant piece in this for the Flames that's a conditional piece. I could see a second or even another first-round pick being conditional on Jerome signing next year wherever he goes to. Yeah, or like a, you know, like we get a first and an additional first if we make the finals or, again, the resign. Well, that, yeah, that, that's kind of what I mean. Like, we'll get a first, and then there might be an extra first or a second or something worthwhile on the line should Jerome put his name down with that team. So, Matt, you think the Bruins are where he's ultimately going to end up? Yeah. Uh, the Bruins have quite a few good but not spectacular prospects, and that where you could see two or three of them and the first getting included. Guys like Tory Krug and uh, Ryan Spooner. I think the Bruins have a lot of young NHL-ready guys, or guys that are already in the NHL that they'd be willing to flip. And according to the r- rumors, too, Peter Chiarelli is the hot hottest pursuit for Jerome right now. Yeah. So, it's one of those things that it really depends on the fit and whether they're wanting quantity over quality or a mixture of both. Let, let's just you know. please get quality. Like honestly, I would. I know they're not doing this, but w- were it to come up where it would be possible to just do Hamilton straight across for Aginla, make the trade yesterday. But, and I don't like if. But I mean, if they're balking at including Subban, like I can't imagine. Like that, that, that. Maybe this is just part of the negotiation dance. But if you've got Tuka Rask and you're preparing to re-sign him, and Tuka Rask, by all accounts, and his own performance is, you know, the real deal. He can win a Stanley Cup with Tuka Rask. Um, why are you so hesitant to give up Malcolm Subban? Like, isn't that the whole reason you acquire, you draft Malcolm Subban in the first place? And this goes back to the value of prospects being that you draft someone with a lot of hype around them, so you can flip them for say. Jerome McGinley, when there's no reason that Malcolm Subban really needs to be in your organization. 
except to acquire a key player at the deadline. Yeah, and I mean, you know, some organizations like to keep those guys. They may not see Rask as being feasible long term. Who knows? But, you know, there's a lot of GMs that like to have those guys. It almost makes them, I think, sleep better at night knowing we've got this young goalie who we can rely on should something happen to Rask almost as an insurance policy. I mean, I guess, but I, I don't know how much you really. Since, since Malcolm Subban is so unproven at this point, and. At the same time, Peter Torelli's track record says he knows a lot better what he's doing than Jay Feaster. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the thing. I, I still, if we manage to, I, I'm I'm concerned with the whole Kipper not going to accept a trade to anyone. Um, move. But... So he just to just to refresh people who haven't heard that. Sorry to interrupt you. Kipper soft announced, I guess, and I haven't seen him say it, but I've been seeing it written all over. That if he gets traded, he's not going to report to the team. He just had a new baby. His family's in Calgary. He doesn't want to report anywhere else. Yeah. Um, well, okay, yeah. And I'm with that said, assuming, you know, he's told the organization, I'm also coming back next year. Uh, I don't know. I, it still makes sense, I guess, in that situation to get uh, Malcolm Subban or whatever because when he, when he is gone, if you're not going to extend them or extend him, you, I think, need to have at least two or three different possibilities to who are ready to at least try and step in and replace him. Because, yeah, I agree with you. Whether it's Subban or Bernier or somebody else, I've always thought if the Flames could come to camp next year with Kippersoff, Bernier or Subban, Ramo, and whoever they re sign from the current crop, probably Danny Taylor, it gives you a lot of nice options coming out of camp, and then it gives you a piece you can flip for whatever you feel you don't have at that point. Um, the one thing that uh, I've always thought, like if you've looked at the uh, goalies that have been signed out of overseas, like Victor Fast, uh, Jonas Hiller, and several others. Like, the Flames need some goalie prospects. Like, no one's debating that. But why not try and find a guy like those guys that are excelling overseas and give them an opportunity, like Ramo, and get more that way instead of actually trading a legitimate asset like again. Well, that's it. I think they're putting Ramo as their guy in that role. Yeah. I know, but like you could get another one or two. But it might also like, be hard really... to convince Europeans to come play in Calgary if we're not a good team either. I, I, I don't know. I think Europeans trying to break into the NHL, especially at that age, are just looking for anyone to give them a shot. And if you say, come to Calgary, we're going to give you a shot. If you're good enough, you're going to be our number one. Like, that's that's the goal. Or the, that, that's the dream for them. I think... Yeah, I think what, you know, and I, I don't know what Feaster's thinking, but I think what he might be thinking with trying to acquire a Subban or a Bernier is, okay, if Kipper comes back next year, it gives the new guy, the heir apparent, a year to shadow the old guy, if that makes sense, to see how Kipper does things, to see how this team runs, to get inside his head before he's gone. Uh, I don't... It's possible. I think that is so very much overrated especially maybe not maybe everyone does it but we do this with Iginla we do this with Kiprasov think about all the other goalies who've had a chance to watch Kiprasov for years at a time Curtis McElhaney when I look at all the team pictures uh I'm astonished at how many different ones he's in considering he never once did anything to deserve being in any of them but I also don't think that McElhaney was ever seen by the organization as the heir apparent. No, but then why was he here? It's just, you, you know what I mean? Because like, he's a cheap yeah, backup. Yeah, every backup is cheap. That's why they're backups. They're just happy to sit around, hold a clipboard, and cash an $800,000 a year check. Like, ultimately, I mean, Kipper, no one, as far as I can tell, has ever really learned anything from... Kiprasov, other than, you know, don't look like you really care. Or, uh, no, and I'm not saying he doesn't, but like, just don't let anything bother you. Uh, just be your own, be the captain of your own pirate ship. Never change the style of your mask too much. And, uh... I mean, to his credit, McElhaney has had a better career since he left here than he oh, did really? here. So maybe he... 
it hasn't been great, but I mean, he's, you know, he got, what, one win as a flame, and he's had a lot more since he's left here, so he keeps getting re-signed by NHL teams. They obviously something, see something in him. I remember last summer, the summer before, he was a UFA, and I thought, wow, somebody actually signed this guy, this goof. So it's like, somebody sees something in him. He's obviously getting work for some reason. I'm sure he's a nice guy, but I mean... The fact that, like, he hasn't, he's never done anything. I'm a nice guy, too. Nobody's asked me to hold a clipboard. Exactly. So, but uh, the the point is, I don't think if you are, like, this is the whole, like, this is the, this, this is the and maybe that, Kipper's mentality changes too in his last year. You know, maybe he sees himself as that guy of, okay, I'm leaving. It's not my job to defend anymore. Well, no, because I, I don't, I don't think that. I think it's just that, you know, he, he is who he is because he just, he plays to be the best, I guess. They're the best player he can possibly be, obviously. And I don't think it's ever like, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to be here next year, so I guess I'm going to relax a bit. Like, I, I think if you bring another guy in, especially a guy with the pedigree of Jonathan Bernier, you bring him in to uh, to play him. You don't bring him in to back up Kiprasov. Well, another thing that I'm a little concerned with, if we do go and get a stopgap goalie or, you know, like a Bernier type of thing, our defense is terrible. (laughs) And, you know, like Kipper and like all the goalies get hung out to dry. And like, if you're looking at a young goalie, it's hard to actually emerge into a quality starter if you're teams giving up like 15 or 20 good good scoring chances every game you know like you have to stand on your head or you're gonna give up five goals and like kipper tonight like he was unbelievable and like if he wasn't on his game like it would have probably been seven or eight nothing for chicago instead of two nothing so i'm just worried about them misusing assets when like they have more pressing concerns outside yeah for sure i know what you're saying but at the same time i think you also have to look at it that we now have movable assets and if we wait two or three years to get a better goalie it might be a lot harder to acquire because we're not going to have assets that are worth as much oh no i'm not saying like uh not to try and get someone but not to waste the assets that you're going to be possibly moving yeah. now for someone for and now. Truthfully, I think, okay. you know, it might be difficult for us to go out and get someone, but honestly, a successful organization gets it from inside. Uh, and whether it's Braswat or Gillies or whoever, or some guy from Europe, Ramo, um, internally, that's how you succeed as an organization and the other thing to consider is it's not like this is a one-year bad team this team is going to be bad next year it's probably going to be bad the year after that we are, we're gonna have assets we're gonna make transactions guys will emerge guys will fall and we'll be able to make moves boy was that vague and worth everyone's time <laughs> There's been some talk lately that I've heard from um, sportscasters, not so much in Calgary, but looking at journalists and sportscasters around the league, who said that the trade of Jerome McGinley could be the most monumental, most important trade the Flames organization has made. What do you guys make of that comment? To me, I think that's a little overblown. It might be the most monumental trade currently, but I don't think you can say this is the most important trade in the history of this organization. No, that would be the Gilmore trade that began the... And the you know this beginning of the death by a thousand paper cuts that the flames felt over the nineties. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking of too. So yeah, that was the beginning of the systematic dismantling of the team. We've already kind of gone through that, and again, was just the last piece of the pie. Well, actually, to me, to me, again, it's like a you know an addict finally going to an a to an AA meeting or you know something like that. It's this is finally the team admitting we have to open a new chapter of this book and we have to put this one behind us but i don't necessarily think it's the most important trade ever i think it's a sigh of relief and if they do it right it's a great way for them to move forward it's not like this trade's going to cripple us for years to come or anything no like the example that most makes sense would be the theo flurry trade Mm -hmm. 
you know, because that was the last of the old guard, and you know. And boy, did okay, we ever get now, rid of Theo at the right time. Yeah, and you know, then we phased on to okay, we're gear and again, are your new guys, and you ran with them for the next ten years. So, you know, like, just because you're ending the line with the Ginla doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to be in the wilderness for, you know, six, seven I, years. I do think, though, that this trade, this trade's importance lies in the fact that it, it could potentially speed up the rebuild process by a year or two and, and turn what could, it, it could take you from what would be a four or five year rebuild to a three or four year rebuild. But rest assured, like whether or not you trade him again, as I said earlier, they're not going to be good for a while. And no, and that's what we have to accept as flames fans. Well, like if you look at what Brendan Morrow, uh, returned and even, uh, Douglas Murray, like Morrow was Joe Morrow, not Brendan. Uh, he's a, top prospect and you know a guy that's looking potentially like a first pairing defenseman in the future and getting two second round picks for Douglas Murray like it that kind of shows like the value of players like that and the Flames like Giordano and Bo Meester are both more valuable than Douglas Murray just because they're offensive defensemen and Amongst the forwards, we have four or five guys that are in more of value or at least equivalent in value as Brendan Morrow. So if you actually trade off several of these guys, you could end up getting eight or nine good pieces to really accelerate the rebuild that are actually showing something instead of like just a draft pick where who knows. And I'm glad those and, trades have already happened because it's set the market value for any deals the Flames are about to make. Mm-hmm. And you can actually get a good foundation, plus you're freeing up so much money, and you can reinvest that in the off season, and, you know, really turn it around quickly. Oh, I was going to say this earlier, but uh, our life has been un- become unmanageable, and we no longer... Uh, have, uh, sorry, how does this go? My life has become manageable, and I am powerless uh, over a desire to see Jerome McGinley score 50 goals. That would be the Iggy's Anonymous uh, uh, first step. There you go. I believe. We're talking about the uh, the flurry trade, and I just went back and actually looked at what that deal was because you know I think it is comparable of the old guard for the new guard. Do you guys remember how much crap I actually traded hands in that trade in no. that deal? Well, I believe we got Rene Corbet, Wade Belak, and Robin Regeer. There was more than that, but uh, Calgary got rid of Theo Fleury and Chris Dingman. Probably crap we we needed to get rid of in exchange for Rene Corbet, Wade, Wade Belak, Robin Regeer, who at the time, if I remember, had two broken legs and wasn't expected to play again, and Colorado's <laughs> second round. Co- compensation choice, which ended up being Jared Stoll, who went back in the draft because we couldn't get him signed. <laughs> so, I mean, if the, if that's the last blockbuster the Flames made, hopefully this one's going to turn out better for this organization. I'm reading a note here on Wikipedia about the Robin Regeer thing. So, yeah, he did have two um, two broken legs. He got in a snowboard accident. And I guess the Colorado GM at the time, I think it was a snowmobile accident. No, it was, uh, whatever. Anyway. Um, I'm just going by what Wikipedia says, but it said the Flames had the option to take almost any prospect in the Colorado organization at the time, and they passed on guys like Alex Tangay, who were also Colorado prospects at that time. So it's funny how that comes back around, that they wanted Tangay, the team wouldn't give him to him, and eventually we ended up getting him anyways. Yeah. Um, God, you know what? Well, this, organize, this organization's been run rather poorly like which is evidenced by the fact that since we won the cup we've only got out of the first round once on the plus side i don't think chicago los angeles boston or pittsburgh have any quadriplegic prospects that we could possibly trade for 
That's good. Matt's the one that's been doing our heavy scouting here. So, Matt, you should go see if all their prospects have working legs. They do. Anybody with like early that. onset good. ALS. If we have any fans listening in those markets and you know of any players that are perhaps doing dangerous things that we don't want to acquire, please forward their names to us and we'll make sure Flames management Who's gets got them. Lou Gehrig's disease. Who's got scurvy? Yes, scurvy. Any players who aren't eating their oranges. Well, there was that one Islander was a goalie prospect uh, who had a vitamin problem, and uh, he was having issues and ended up having to take a whole bunch of vitamins. As soon as you say Islanders and goalie, I immediately tune out and just think of what a Rec Di Pietro is. Did you just call him Rec Di Pietro? <laughs> <laughs> DP Rectro. That, that could work as well. All sorts of fun names for Ricky D. I just got um, a text message from TSN that uh, UC Jokinen has been placed on waivers. Oh, yeah. 29-year-old, oh. $3 million contract. As much as we don't want to add, do you think it's a, uh, a lucrative thing for, uh, for the team to go after, trying to claim him? It, it would be if we didn't have 49 contracts. Um, yeah, that's where I'm concerned as well. Thanks thanks for Sarich and Babchuk, Feaster. Thanks for Sarich and Babchuk. Well, that's it. I think if you get Jokinen, you could put Babchuk on waivers just long enough to move another contract out and then either send him down or try to get him on re-entry and get someone to bite, who knows. But I think that within the next 72 hours, something's going to happen. Well, it has to. So I think you yeah. could take Jokinen and you could make... A contract space for seventy two hours. It's an it's an intriguing idea. He's only making three million next year. I'd, I'd take him, but it's just it, it, the way you are. It's such a risk that if that at all has the chance to impact you long th- in this at the deadline, like you, you can't afford to do it. Like you, the, the team has been burned too much by gambles in the past, and right now they need to they they need to do this smart, responsible thing here. Jokinen is not what the team needs, and he would be useful, I admit. But no, just settle down. He's a left Keep winger who will make into a, cent- into a center. See, Jokinen's actually a decent skater. And he's oh, like I have no but... problem with Jokinen. It's just, like, that sends a wrong message entirely, because, like, that, to me, is adding. <laughs> and, it's, it's adding, like, but I think it's strategically adding. It's a young player with one year left on a deal. Oh, I'm not arguing that. It's just, you know, it just sends the wrong message to the fans and everything. Like, just, like, if you could trade someone before then, just to make sure, like, to emphasize that we are rebuilding, then or if I'd you be could, fine with or it. Or if you could get Jokin in before people have a chance to complain, you send somebody out of here. That, uh, it's, it's all... It just bringing him in at this point would scream of like, "Hey, look at what we're doing. We're trying to be better." But is like, there any really... rule that says you can't trade a guy within so long after you uh, pick him up from waivers? I mean, what if we picked him up I and think, flipped him? Yeah, I think you have to offer him back to the team that waived him in the first place for free. Oh, okay. Before you can accept the trade, which they would take because, oh, hey, that team's interested in sending me this. So yeah. Okay. Uh, Matt, you were mentioning the Moro trade earlier and some of these trades that have been made. Do you think that they're going to impact the uh, market for Jerome, or do you think they're just there to set a precedent at this point? I know some people have said that because uh, Pittsburgh got Moro, that that makes Boston even more hungry to go and try and get a Ginla. Well, it could make um, certain teams want to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. And with Pittsburgh now looking almost unbeatable. Like, if they were to go out and get Jerome as well, like, that would be, like, the worst thing ever if you're either the Bruins or the Canadians or whatever. So they might add a little something extra just to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like, I, I really think that some, especially if the Boston Bruins actually do pull a trigger on this, which I think they will, uh, I'm sure a lot of it is going to be motivated on. You just don't want to run the risk of Pittsburgh going to hell with it. Here's Pouliot, give us a Ginla. Yeah, I agree. Because even with Chera and 
that defense and that team. You, <laughs> Good, well, luck and I think all three, good, luck, good luck stopping three lines of that. I think we can all agree as as fans, that's the position we want to be in as sellers of this team. You know, as this with this team as sellers, we want to be in a position where guys are having to give us crazy bids to keep Jerome from their their rivals. Yeah, because like if, if you're in Boston's shoes, like you can't have Chara playing forty minutes a night. Like that's what you would have to do against Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. just because they have so many options and. So you might end up getting something a little extra, like say if uh, Boston's offering Subban, Spooner, and a first, you might be able to get them to throw in another decent prospect in that mold as well, or a second, or whatever. But you might be able to get a little something extra just to (laughs) screw the Penguins. (laughs) You know what, if if I'm the Flames, I really don't think I... uh... Unless Pitts, unless Boston offers that extra bit right away, um, I'm not trading them at Ginla until probably you know half an hour before the deadline. Like, don't cut it too close so that like a fax machine error screws you over. But, Didn't that happen a couple um, of years ago? There was a deal that it, didn't get It apparently get in? happens all the time. Uh, the well, oil, why are we still faxing? It's 2013. Why are we still faxing deals? I know, like. That's what happened with Stoll, I do believe. That's why we weren't able to sign him, because the fax machine broke back when we drafted him. Well, that that also happened uh, to the Oilers in 2005-2006. They were supposed to get Dean McCammond, and a uh, the fax didn't go in in time, and uh, that was that. But... I mean, there. I also wouldn't play Jerome. I know, Dan, you made a thread about this the other day. Um, I wouldn't play Jerome until the deadline. Now, like, there's, like, what you're going to risk him blocking a shot? Not that he really does that, but anything happening to him whatsoever. Yeah, I posted a like, thread on Calgary Puck about that, and I wanted to ask you guys that. Is I'm surprised, honestly, they played tonight. Do you think we see him play any more games to the deadline? Well, the thing is, is that I. In the St. Louis game, at the start of the game, Ginla's usually either on the ice to start the game or is on the second shift. And for the first four minutes, Ginla didn't, his line didn't come out, and he was only out there once prior to Cervenka scoring. So, you know, and then he played a regular shift after that. So I think that, you know, they're already trying to minimize his ice time, but they're waiting until we lose. Because I think they might think the St. Louis game was the perfect end to his Flames career. He got a goal, he salutes the crowd, and after that you stop playing him. Yeah. Because the last thing I want to do is see him get hurt, and then a deal gets nullified. I know. Like uh, That's why I'm hoping that tomorrow when we wake up that you know, trades have been made instead of, you know, because we do play again tomorrow, I do believe, against Colorado. Yeah, the Flames play at home tomorrow against Colorado, and then Friday against the uh, Blue Jackets at home. So, like, I would hope that when we wake up that there's, you know, some action and, you know, trades are made, so that way the whole injury thing is off the table. And there, if you think about it, there really is no reason for him to be in the lineup tomorrow no. or when, or Friday. Like, okay, you don't, so they don't, uh, you know, you don't get to really send him off or whatever. But that that's so not important right now for the long term health of the franchise. Well, he so. got his home send off after the St. Louis game. He got to salute the crowd. To me, that should have been that should be his last game at the dome. Exactly. And I, I, you know, I, I like Lucas's idea of if we're not getting the deal we want, wait till the deadline. Who knows? Maybe another buyer emerges at the, at the deadline that Jerome's willing to go to. But if you have to, you know, go as long as you can. And but don't play Jerome. You know, tell him you for the first time in your career you get to go up and see what it looks like watching from the press box. Enjoy the night off. Yeah, and like if you don't trade him, then like that's weird and whatnot but you can come back from that it's not like benching a quarterback like if they don't trade him they don't trade him but understand that at the moment we can't have you play it's an insurance policy yeah we have to do what we have to do it's just pragmatic the team has to do what they have to do to protect their assets and that's what jerome mcginley is he's an asset for this hockey franchise yeah 
and you don't want to get lose two prospects in a first round pick, which was the likely return, just because he wanted to play, or because you wanted to beat Columbus. Yeah, he, you know, that's why I'm hoping that that he's, you know, if they're gonna trade him, trade him tomorrow type of thing and get it over with. Yeah, every yeah. day I'm checking my phone as I'm, you know, at work and I'm going. Any minute now, I'm going to get that text that there's a press conference in five minutes. There's a press conference, you know, because Jerome has been traded. That big text from TSN, or maybe not even Jerome, maybe Bo or somebody, but I'm surprised there's been no movement yet. I thought somebody would have moved. Yeah, like even if it was a Sarich or something, you know, someone, but, you know. Honestly, I think once the Iggy Domino goes, I think you'll see probably at least two or three more significant notable trades. I wouldn't be surprised if Feaster's got a couple in the bag and he's kind of stacking them up so we can send three guys out of here at once. I would hope. He hasn't talked to anyone in a month, so he's got to be doing something. And Lucas, we know your thoughts on uh, Feaster and his talking, but I was thinking about this today on my way home. I think that this team needs a GM who can do the talking after they make these deals. They need the guy who can be that mouthpiece. And I really think of all the guys we've had lately, Feaster's the right guy for that. Uh, you know what? I, uh, I'm i really starting to think that as much as I like some of the things he's done, uh, if we need to, if we can go with a different GM, I'm fine with that. If you look at what he was brought on to do, which is get the team back into the playoffs, simply based on that alone, he's failed miserably and the team has gotten worse every year he's been here which is not necessarily all his fault, but he was hired on the grounds that he was going to do one thing. He hasn't done that. And as such, I think dismissing him after this season is completely justified. Teams have different and, GMs for different stages of their process, and there's GMs that are good at rebuild, and there's GMs that are good at bringing into the playoffs, and maybe that's what the Flames need is a rebuild GM. They, they definitely do. And with Feasters talking, I would like whoever the GM is needs to not tell us about stuff that almost happened all that because all that matters is what what you have what you can prove and i don't care if you were in on brad richards and oh we almost got o'reilly or we were in on this guy we were in on that guy don't care don't tell me because if you don't tell me i can't look at you as a failure i just like okay he's doing something i'm sure he was we can be like i'm sure he was in on it but Whatever, for whatever reason, it didn't go. Um, but when you come out and say, we were in there to the last minute, well, it's like, well, why didn't you close it? Why, if you can't, we should get someone who who could. Berkey's looking for work. Well, the thing is, is that I, I still don't mind Feaster and the job he's done thus far. He kind of came into a really... I agree with Matt. I think he yeah, came like in he at a had, bad time. Yeah, like, you can say, oh, well, you know, it's sort of like Obama in the States. Like, the economy tanks, and then, well, you know, because he didn't clean it up fast enough. That, Bush left him know, a mess, and because he couldn't clean it all up, he's a bad president. Yeah, like, it's not all Feaster's fault. You know, like, you got a declining core of your team. You have zero prospects. Mm-hmm. Well... You know, you you can maybe work miracles, but you know. <laughs> well, and to the me, the, the that... fact is, Feaster's got a cup, and you know, you can argue it was in Tampa, which isn't you know wasn't a great team to start with, but the man's got a cup, and I think we have to give him some time to, especially if he's the guy that pulls the trigger on Jerome to see this whole plan through. Yeah. yeah. And... Yeah, you know, like if you years. look at well, no, if you look at the players that he's acquired, Weidman, he's done fairly good for what he is. Hoodler, Hoodler's done good for what he is. The prospects he's drafted, Gaudreau's done done a good job. He made a good Ber- trade to get Cami back. Berchi's doing good. Jankowski's looking like a possibility. Some of the lower round guys are playing decently. So looks like he got rid of a gear at the right time. Yeah, so it's not all bad. So, you know, 
I, I wouldn't mind letting him continue until it becomes apparent that, you know, he's not doing a good job. But at this point, it, there's too much that you can blame on other people. <laughs> well, and in a way, too, I think this city's used to blaming the GM. Um, you know, it's been something we've been doing for so long. We blame the GM, we blame the coach. I think in a way it just becomes natural for Flames fans to, oh, they shit the bed again. It's the GM's fault. Yeah. Well, personally, I mean, usually I would say first and foremost it's the player's fault, but it's when it's when the GM doesn't acknowledge that the players could be a problem, that's when it becomes the GM's fault. And I think silently he's been doing that by making some of the moves he has, like getting rid of some of those core guys like Regeer. And, I mean, he didn't come out and say it, but he's been trying to change this core and put a different core of players in place probably because there's a problem. Yeah, or like Lanko for Stephanie Axe. Bring in like guys that. like Weidman, who are a big part of the new core, if you will. Yeah. Bring in decent support, guys. We need a whole new core. And I would say that Bergey's going to be a core piece, but other than and possibly Brody, but I don't think even Brody is a core, core player. Bro, everyone except organizationally, everyone except Sven Bergey feels like a supporting cast person. Yeah, we don't have a, a Taze or a Kane, which that's why I'm hoping that the Flames pick in the top four because each one of those players looks like they could be a primary piece to a team. It'd be nice to have one of those again. Not not just one in name. I think, you know, what we said last week really sums it up best, too. But go Flames, go for the long term. It's going to be a long-term rebuild, and somebody's got to keep the faith. And if we can't run a fan cast about the team, who's going to? It's hard, but I think we've got to look at the positive as much as we can and look towards the future. Yeah, and I'm just hoping that this time next week we have several new prospects to look forward to watching. And, you know analyzing the trades and oh who who are the new guys and all that stuff and yeah I, I hope we'll be able to celebrate a new chapter of the flames instead of going how is jerome still a flame and what did they change and they trade away a seventh rounder for what old guy again hopefully we're not standing around going this trade deadline was the most disappointing thing since my son <laughs> Well, guys, unless you've got anything else, I think that's a good note to end things on. Yeah, I'm good to go. All right. Next week, we're going to be recording a little bit later so we can make sure that we get our thoughts in after the uh, trade deadline moves. So instead of recording on our usual Tuesday, we'll be doing it later in the week. And I really hope there's something to talk about there. Um, let's. Here's to hoping. Here's to hoping this team does the right thing and moves forward. As usual, I want to invite everyone to check us out online at firesidechat.ca and from there you can follow us on Twitter follow us on Facebook, you can subscribe to get updates every week uh, Matt's working really hard writing a bunch of articles for the site, all the podcasts are there so there's a lot of great Flames content for those of you that still want to hear and read and be immersed in this team with that I'm done and we'll see everyone next week any last words gentlemen? suck it Tom Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.